Revelation chapter number 14. <clears throat> we'll begin reading where we left off last week, verse number 13. <clears throat> the Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses, the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, if you'll remember last week, we talked about Israel out in the wilderness how God made provision for them for the 144,000 until they get down to 144,000 now the study of the end times eschatology whatever you want to call it it is not written linearly okay God does not constrain the man's timetable what did he tell Moses his name was I am Right? Man thinks of his, him as the same as yesterday, today, and forever. God just always has been. So as John is receiving the book of Revelation, as Daniel interpreted his dreams and prophecy regarding the end times, as Isaiah had prophecies a few times that were regarding things to come, as other prophets, you can't take them as story starts here, story finishes here, and it's a smooth path the entire way. Okay, we just dealt with how Israel would survive the persecution of the beast in the first half of the chapter. Then verse number 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's not just talking about the 144,000 in the wilderness. That's talking about anyone that has faith in Christ Jesus. Here's their patience. But here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then... Verse number 13, it says, and. You know what that means? I mean, it's something different. Something addition to. So we're not talking about Israel in the wilderness anymore. He says, and. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right. So this is something not just in addition to. He's saying, hey, jot this down. John's just writing it down the way that God gave it to him. Okay, well, verse number 13 says, Right, blessed are they which die in the Lord from henceforth. Where's John at? John's been called up to there, and he's seeing things in the future. But any time that you see in the book of Revelation where it says right, he's not writing it for people that are going to be in the tribulation period. He's writing it for those that are to come or that exist already. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's exiled. We've already seen where God's told him, you got to go back and you got to tell all manner of Gentiles this final revelation from God. You've got to write it down, seven literal letters to churches that are in Asia. So when he says, write this down, he says, this also is for you to go and tell people. So where's John at? Well, John's at about... A.D. 95 to 100, somewhere in there. What's the Apostle John supposed to write to those people and everybody that will pick up the Word of God after that? Henceforth. You know what that means? Right now. Any time from here until the end. Henceforth, 
Yea, the Spirit, or yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. It says, right, blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from now until the end. Now, it doesn't say die with the Lord. Israel, the 144,000 in the wilderness, they're not going to die in the wilderness. We haven't gotten to that part yet. But they don't die. They live. They have children during the millennial reign. And their children have children and grandchildren and so on and so forth. Till the earth is repopulated. This inscription that die in the Lord, let's talk about saved people. Does not the Bible say that He's in you and you're in Him? You know how that happened? Salvation. When the blood was applied to your life, He became just as much a part of you as you became of Him. Well, how much did He become, or did you become a part of Him? I find that you're engraved in the palm of His hands. I find that He's made a promise that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That He's closer than any other. That He hears all the thoughts and knows all the intents of your heart. You're as much a part of Him as He is God. Because He promised that He would make you a part of Him. And if God does it, it can't be undone. So that's how much He should be a part of you. But we're not going to teach on that. It says, blessed are those that die in the Lord. Henceforth. Why? Because the Spirit, capital S says that they may rest from their labors if you died not in the Lord let's go back in the Old Testament economy they had not received salvation yet they didn't have the promise that to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord what they had was a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise it was a perfect environment. There was no pain. There was no suffering. There was no sin. But they had no rest. It was a holding place. They were still there waiting on something that was promised. What was that? Christ. When the Bible says that he led captivity captive, he had to go preach to them, and they had to believe on the same blood that you believed on when you got saved. Had to believe on the same Christ that you believed on. And that was the day that Abraham's, par or Abraham's bosom in paradise, the lights were shut out because there was no more need for it. There is no holding place between here and God for those that are born again. He says, blessed are those that die in the Lord henceforth. In the olden days, they had a place that was perfect, but yet they still had a desire that they hungered to be fulfilled. That was to be present with God. It was their faith and their love and their commitment to God that secured them a place in Abraham's bosom, but they couldn't see him until what? Until the blood had been applied. They finally had a rest. Well, here it says the Spirit says that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. He says... If you die in the Lord from the time that Revelation was written until the time that it's fulfilled, he says you're doubly blessed. First, to be absent from the body, we know is to be present with him. That is a great blessing. Then there's the blessing of what a rest from our labors. Did not the Apostle Paul say that I fought a good fight? I finished my course. What's that mean? He labored up until God said, your laboring's done. And it is a great blessing to be received into heaven knowing that you left it all on the line. That you gave it everything that you had and because you gave it everything you had in labor for the Lord, now you can rest fully in the Lord. There will be no more regret. There will be no more, well, I could have. There will be no, well, Lord, I know I should have done this. No, if you give it everything you got, there is a rest. But then the double blessing is what? That you know that your works do follow you. 
There's nothing more disappointing as somebody with ADHD, I can tell you personally, that you sit down and you decide you're going to do something one day and then you get distracted by everything else because the phone's ringing or somebody calls and asks for it or you get a text message or boss man asks you if you could do this, that, or the other. And then the one thing that you wanted to do, you don't get to finish it. And then if you're like me, you don't find time to finish it for probably another three years. Why? Because there's more important things to do. Anybody ever been like that? Yeah, Brother Randy, he's raised the same eyes. I know he's the same way. Right? What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that there's a, a gnawing at your conscience, at your soul, for something that you desired to do, but yet it was left unfinished. Here the Spirit Himself says that your works do follow you. Just because you didn't get to see the finished work of what God had used in your life for you to do for Him does not mean that the work stops when you walk off the scene. This verse is a further promise, not just of the perpetuity of the church, right? but that God's remnant will always continue the work that the previous generation started. According to your Bible, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I know it's easy to grow weary in well-doing, but it's verses like these that remind us the work's worth doing even if it doesn't come to fruition in your life. Right? How many people in this room could each one of us go around and say, there's a person in glory today whose fingerprints are still all over my life. That because what they yielded themselves to God and God allowed them to do for me to this day that work is still bearing fruit that there was somebody that because of the love of the Lord they did something for God never knew me never met them never had a conversation with them but yet the labor that they had for the Lord still bore fruit in my life I was able to taste of the Lord because they planted the seed so long ago those days that you say, well, Lord, I just don't understand why I'm doing this. God knows exactly why you're doing it. And God knows exactly after you're off the scene how whatever He's asking you to do now will bear fruit for His honor and His glory. Your works do follow you. When someone that is lost dies, all the works that they had aspired to do, they die with them. But if your works are a labor for the Lord, they never truly die. Because your work was not in what you could do, your labor was for what God could do. God is not limited by the grave. He proved that three days after Calvary. God is not limited by time. He's been the same for forever. The same one that said, I am, also said, let there and everything that is in existence became existed. He just spoke it into existence. The same God that made dirt, then made man out of dirt, breathed into him the breath of life, is the same one that whispers to you, as long as you do what the Lord says in the Lord's time, in the perfect will of God, your works will follow you. Now here's the other side of that coin. Did not God tell Israel that the sin of the Father is passed down to the third and fourth generation. The carnal labors of man may not carry on. I mean, there's some people today that have the name Rockefeller that have never worked a day in their life, yet they're richer than anybody. Why is that? Because that's been handed down from the Father. But sin, spiritual decisions, does have ramifications. Your labor in the Lord carries on, but so do the labors of sin. If you toil in that, your great-grandchildren may have to pay the price for the things that you did. You want a good example? Look at America today. Because several generations ago, people decided to start slipping on some things. Or they permitted something to happen knowing that they could have done something to stop it. Spiritually, there's always ramifications for the next generation. 
But those in Christ have the hope and the promise and the security, the blessing of knowing that their works will follow them. That when their labor comes to an end, God's still working. God will bring to fruition what God started. But then we get verse number 14, and. What does that mean? Also. Something different. I looked and beheld a white cloud, and one that sat upon the cloud, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Again, where is he at? He's in a cloud. Last time we saw him, he was hovering above the ground in a cloud. Right? He still has not set foot on earth yet. This is not the Lord's second coming. Where's he at? He's in the clouds. And he's got a sharp sickle. What do you do with sickles? You cut down ripened crop. It says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now there's a lot of conjecture about what this harvest is. Because in verse number 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. A lot of conjecture. A lot of people that don't read their Bible study the Bible. They study what somebody else said. will tell you that this is an illustration of God bringing out the 144,000 and saving them. God doesn't reap the 144,000 anywhere. He delivers to them a peaceful earth under the reign of Jesus Christ. To reap means that you cut something down and then carry it away. Again, things being nonlinear, that's why we started off reminding you of that. I do believe that this is what we would call the rapture. The catching away of the saints. You say, Brother Jordan, this isn't the beginning of the book of Revelation. God doesn't care. God wrote it the way that God wrote it. But right after he reminds you that your labor does have a meaning, that your works are going to follow you, he gives you a little glimpse of what the rapture is going to be like. What happens? Well, Jesus comes out on a cloud. And what's he got? He's got a sickle. You know what a sickle does? It separates something that's plugged into the earth and it cuts it away from the earth. Right? That's what you do when you harvest. You take something that was planted in dirt and you separate it from the dirt. What's the rapture? That thing that he planted inside of this earthen vessel that you've got, one day he's coming with a sickle to separate it from the dirt and to take it to where? Glory. Where you'll have a glorified body. It says that the earth was reaped. You know what that means? All the good was taken out of it. All the things of profit. All the things of use. All the things that the Father planted and had a purpose for to bear fruit are taken away. We're not going to get on the whole reaping process and how Jesus said that the enemy came in plant tares among the wheat. The only way to tell them apart is to let them grow and then reap. And when you reap, you cast the tares into the fire and you put the other in the, where? Storehouse. Where's God's storehouse? It's called heaven. But he doesn't come back to the physical earth. He says it's in the cloud. But didn't Jesus himself say, that if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. After this, we see an angel, not Jesus, that had a sickle that comes and collects the vine from the earth. You know what they do? And then we're going to get down to where those grapes are thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. God's wrath has always been ripe. But God has delayed. Why? So that the sun could come first and have a bountiful harvest of those that believed on him. But Jesus isn't sending an angel for you. What's he doing? He's going to meet you in the air. He's coming himself. When he comes to meet the 144,000, 
He doesn't come in a cloud. He lands on the Mount of Olives. He comes back for the second time, the second coming. So how can Jesus reap away those that he hasn't come and set foot on the mountain to save yet? That, that don't make sense. What's this reaping? This is the reaping of the saints. Know that even if, remember he told you, blessed are those that die in the Lord. You're blessed because your labors come to an end and your works do follow you. But he's saying, even if you're around, right when this thing's about ready to kick off, you're still blessed because he's coming to get you personally. He's going to meet you in the sky. When does he do it? When an angel comes out of the temple saying, hey, go do it. Doesn't the Apostle Paul's account of the rapture say that with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, where does this angel in this glimpse that the Apostle Paul got, where does it come from? The temple. You know what the temple is? That's God's house. When God the Father says, go tell them to go, the angel shouts, go get them, and he came and got them. In fact, if you look back, verse number 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having in his hand, or having in his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. He's already out on the cloud waiting. I believe that he's got the sickle reared back. He's just waiting for the Father to say, Reap! That shout, that voice of the archangel comes flying out of the temple. And he says, the father says, go. Before the angel can finish, go. He's already gone. This account matches up perfect with the account of the rapture that the apostle Paul gives us in the epistles. It's Christ coming back to get what? The church to reap what it is that he planted and he started who else but Christ would be able to reap the church he's the one that founded it he's the one that paid for it and he's the one that loved it he's the one that throughout all these centuries has watered those seeds that he planted he is the head of the church who else but Christ would come back and get the thing that he started but then we see another reaping. Verse number 17. It says, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now again, all these angels are coming out and they're giving commands, but we know that angels don't make the, the decisions. Where are they coming from? Well, one came from the temple. The other one came from the altar. Y'all remember back a couple chapters ago when it said that there were those before the altar of God that eventually white robes were given to them and they cried, Lord, how long will we be unavenged for the wickedness that was done to us because we loved you? Those that came out of the great tribulation. You guys remember when the epistles taught us that Christ grafted in a branch into the vine, the vine being God's people? We, the Gentiles, being the branch that he made us a part of something that we had no right to be a part of. Well, right before this, Christ comes back and what's he do? He reaps that branch. He takes the church. What's left? The vine, the true vine. The vine of God's people. We know he's the vine, Christ, and he added us to him. But there's still the vine that God started. 
He started it with a promise to a fellow named Abram. And eventually his name's changed to Abraham. And he gets a son that he thought he would never have from his wife that they thought she couldn't conceive. His name's Isaac. He had a son named Jacob who God changed his name to Israel. God gives the command to go out and what? To reap the vine. In the Old Testament, the book of Revelation is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. It is the time that God's people will be purified. Part of that purification is going to be some have to die. Some will be not just killed, they will be martyred. Horrific deaths, like we've talked about. But eventually there's coming a point where God says, the vine is finally ripe. Go get my vine. So God sends an angel with a sharp sickle out, just waiting for the time to reap that vine. Then the angel that was at the altar that had the power over fire, he cries out. He says, thrust the sickle into the earth and bring it out. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of God bringing His people out or delivering them from hardship one more time. Only this time, because they have to be pure, some of them have to die a death to prove their faith before they can be brought out or delivered from that situation. Christ died to save God's people. He came into His own and His own received Him not. Why do they have to die in the great tribulation? Because they chose not to accept the one that God sent to die for them. So now if they want to be a part of the vine, they have to be willing to die on the other, the other side. They have to be willing to lay everything down on the earth and say it means nothing to us, we'd rather have God. But that cry, Lord, how long will we not be avenged? God says, go get the grapes. It's time to avenge them. And then we just get a little glimpse of what's to come. Still haven't gotten there yet. But we get a glimpse in verse number 19. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and he gathered, gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. God allowed the vine to be ripe until in His timing everything was arranged. And then He does not take that ripened fruit and give it to Himself. What's He do? He turns around and He gives back to the earth what the earth gave to His people. What was this vine filled with? This vine since the beginning. I can go back to Abraham's life and show you that the world persecuted them. The world tried to drive them out. The world tried to cheat them and to kill them. And throughout all of history, the devil, we've already read about it in the book of Revelation, from the time that he heard that there was coming a one through a woman's virgin birth canal, that would bruise his head even though he would try to bruise his heel he's been trying to destroy the vehicle that God promised would be the method of his delivery that was Israel and some of Israel's hardships were because Israel turned their back on God but others of Israel's hardships were because the world hated God's people we don't have time. I could take you to the book of Isaiah where it says that the earth would swallow up God's people. And if you read that, doesn't it sound a whole lot like people being thrown alive into mass burial graves and the dirt was pushed over top of them with bulldozers? You say, Brother Jordan, when did that happen? Happened throughout all the Holocaust. All the things that were prophesied that would happen to God's people, they've happened. And why did all of those things happen? Because Satan hates God's people. 
And Satan puts into the minds and the hearts of men that they should hate God's people. And if you listen to their logic, it don't make no sense. They come up, I mean, go listen to all the skinheads and the Ku Klux Klan and everybody else that hates Jews. Their rationale is, is that, well, we hate them because they killed Jesus. Well, Jesus was a Jew. Right? So if you like Jesus, you like Jews. They don't like that point. They think Jesus was white. Jesus wasn't white. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus wasn't black. He wasn't Chinese. He wasn't Korean. He wasn't Australian. He wasn't anything. He was Jewish. You know why people hate Jewish people? Because God's been good to God's people throughout the centuries. And it's real easy to corrupt the jealous and the bitter heart of somebody that doesn't have and try to convince them that they have everything because they've manipulated everything. That they've, they've made up a group called the Zionists and they think that there's a small group of Jews that run all the economies in the world. Well, if that was true, how come Israel only has a sliver of land about this big? If they owned everything and had all the money, why wouldn't they buy it all? What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Man comes up with a whole bunch of stupid decisions. Also, of course the Jews killed Jesus. We don't let British people execute Americans. Right? We don't send our you know, prison guards over to Africa to carry out their executions. Where was he tried? In a Jewish court. The only reason the Jews didn't carry out the sentence is because of Passover. They said, we don't want to have to go through all the purification. Y'all crucify him. They said, we don't have enough time to do it. But they're the ones that delivered the verdict and then delivered him over to the Romans. They cast him out and they said, we have no use for him. You guys do whatever you want to to him. But all throughout history, God's people, the wrath of the world, the venom of mankind, that was poured out on them. God's been keeping a record of it in the vine. And when God says, that's enough, He takes all of what the world had given to His people and how the world had treated His Son, and He puts it into the wine press of His wrath. And when those wines are crushed and the juice comes flowing out of that wine press, it says it was trodden without the city. Where's God going to pour out His wrath? He's not pouring it out inside of the city where He lives. Right? He throws it out in between heaven and earth and He just lets His wrath fall upon the face of the earth. It says, And the blood came out of the wine press. You know what? people have been doing to God's people what people did to God's son everything that they've rendered unto the vine it's been bloodshed and what are we always reminded of be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap the world sowed bloodshed and when God puts his judgment those grapes into the wine press when it is squeezed and we find out what it is that they put into the ground it's more bloodshed not because that's what God delivered unto them because that's what they chose to receive because of what they did to God's people and to God's son then says that the blood came out of the wine press even up to the horse bridles now there's a bunch of different kind of horses different horses taller than other horses I don't know what kind of horse they're talking about probably an Arabian that's what the apostle John would have known in his day they didn't know shire horses from England right? the giant ones doesn't matter what horse they use and it doesn't matter how high it really was what's it saying 
It's saying for a big distance, the blood that was poured out, it's really deep. You know what that tells me? Nobody got away. The horses survived, though. Because how could you measure to a horse's bridle if a horse was laying down? The horse didn't do it. The people did it. You say, how does that wrath poured out? We'll get to there. That's coming. But the first portion of what we read today, from verse number 13 down to verse number 14, that's Christ preparing for the rapture. Then verse number 15 is Christ fulfilling the rapture. Um, verse number 16, fulfilling the rapture. Verse number 17, 18, and 19 is God's will being fulfilled throughout not just the great tribulation but from the beginning. That God's vine, His chosen people, Right, eventually he will reap what the world did to God's people and to his son and as a result he'll pour it back out on the earth we would call that the end of the tribulation at the valley of or the battle of Armageddon and what's the outcome after God's wrath is put out on this world nothing's going to be left standing man cannot escape what it is that he does but for those that are in Christ you don't want to escape what awaits you because your labor has laid up for you a treasure of righteousness you've got gold, silver and precious gems waiting on you you know that your works follow you you have no regrets about the way that you lived but I can promise you when the grapes are put into the wine press of God's wrath and they begin to be squeezed. Everybody that sees what's coming for them, they're going to regret every decision that they make. For all of eternity, they'll pay for what it is that they did. But I will remind you in verse number 13, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. We are blessed beyond measure that we don't have to take part or receive our part of the wrath of God. We are blessed beyond measure that we get to be the vehicle that God uses to deliver the gospel to others. That we may be the instrument that God uses to keep somebody from tasting the wrath of God. People think that hell is God's wrath. That's not God's wrath. That's a place to inflict torment upon angelic beings. God's wrath is the lake of fire which is the, what the Bible calls the second death. God's wrath will remove you. God's wrath doesn't smack you on the wrist. That's God's chastisement. That's His correction. God's wrath does not go sit in the corner. God's wrath is eternal damnation. He has to cast you so far out of what it is that He wants that you can't stain new heaven and new earth with what it is that you did. How far does he cast them? He cast them so far away that new heaven and new earth can't even be tainted. It won't even be a memory of what used to be. All tears will be wiped from our eyes. We won't even regard the pain and the suffering of sin any longer. How far away is that, Brother Jordan? I don't know, but God does because he's prepared the lake for him already. What are you saying, Brother John? We are blessed. But there are those that right now are cursed with sin. We have so much to look forward to. How could we not go out into a world without hope and say, I know where you can get some hope. We have such security and trust that our works will follow us. Once I'm gone... Whatever I did for the Lord, it will continue. But there also should be the hunger that while I'm still here, I want to do more today than I did yesterday. Because there's coming a time where God's going to send an angel to Jesus and say, reap. And he's reaping. 
And there's coming a day when an angel's going to gather those grapes and throw them into the Lord's wine press, and nothing can prevent that judgment. We're running out of time. We ought to be so appreciative for how blessed that we are that we go out and give some of our blessings to others so that they may taste and that they may become a part of the family of God. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.